Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, how I'm I'm, I'm Patrick. Hello, Patrick. I'm the uh, uh the MC of the Tackle Track today. Um, we are having a track called the Connector Slack. Uh, we will feel free. We will be focused on the Tackle Stack, and uh, we will have uh, eight, a very uh, talented uh speaker today. So the first one is uh, Aaron. So uh, Aaron is actually as uh, uh, the senior uh, security architect from Ota, and he is also um. The, the offer of the uh, OOP 2.0 simplified. Uh, he will be helping and to share about what's new in the OOP 2.1. So, um, Erwin, so I pass to the state to you. Great, thank you so much for the intro. Okay. All right, hi everybody. I'm Aaron Parecki from Okta and looking forward to today, gonna talk about what's new in OAuth 2.1. Go ahead and share my slides. So today we're going to be talking about uh, what's new in OAuth 2.1, and so you know a little bit about what's coming. And I'll set the context for uh, for this work as we sort of go through this presentation as well. So I'm uh, I'm a senior security architect architect at Okta. I'm also a member of the OAuth working group, which is where the OAuth specs were developed uh, are developed and um, I'm one of the ones behind the effort of actually leading OAuth 2.1 and pushing that through uh, through the group. So OAuth 2 was published in 2012, and that was after several improvements on top of OAuth 1, which basically nobody remembers anymore. And OAuth 2 fixed a lot of the things about OAuth 1 that were actually causing problems for developers as well as service providers. So OAuth 2 is essentially a ground up rebuild of OAuth and it doesn't it doesn't work anything like OAuth 1 even some of the terminology changed so it was really a from scratch rebuild but what we now know of OAuth is for the most part OAuth 2 and that's the one that's in production everywhere and a lot of things are built on it now So I want to set the stage for what OAuth 2 is and then talk about how that leads into uh, into where the group is heading with the spec and, and sort of updating the spec. So OAuth 2 is a, a collection of documents and the core document is RFC 6749. It is a, that's the OAuth uh, authorization framework and it includes, essentially it describes a few different grant types. So these grant types are things that uh, are different ways for applications to get access tokens and get access to somebody's account. So we've got like the authorization code, which is probably the most common. Uh, that's the most common grant type. There's the, it defines the implicit flow as well, which historically was used in mobile apps as well as single page apps. It also defines a password grant type when, uh, when you don't want to do a redirect flow and it defines client credentials when there is no user. But at the end of all of these flows, the result is the same. The result is the app has an access token and the access token, uh, isn't actually defined by the spec. In fact, very little about access tokens are defined by the spec, but one of the most common access token types is called a bearer token. So the bearer token was actually, there was a pretty big debate in the early days of OAuth about whether bearer tokens were actually a good idea or not. And essentially bearer tokens won out and became the most common way to do, uh, do OAuth, but it's called a bearer token because whoever holds the token is the one that can use it. So because of this sort of debate that was going on in the group, bearer tokens were actually split into their own RFC. So they're not part of the core RFC. There's actually a separate document that describes bearer tokens. And that document also describes several different ways to use bearer tokens. So that's including it in an HTTP header, including the uh, access tokens in the, in the post body, also including access tokens in the query string. And uh, one of these is a bad idea. So over the years then, um, so, well, OAuth was originally created for um, a few different like use cases in mind. So there was web apps as well as mobile apps, but single page apps were still relatively new. They were kind of becoming a thing, but they weren't, they were still relatively new. But one of the design goals of OAuth 2 was to have it be possible to use in all of these environments where OAuth 1 really couldn't be used safely. So, these kinds of apps, particularly mobile apps and single page apps, have this particular problem, which is that they can't really hold on to API keys. They can't keep secrets. 
Well, you can't ship secrets with them, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So you can't deploy an API key into a mobile app, put it in the app store, and then expect that to remain secret because everybody who downloads that app gets a copy of the secret. And it's even worse with, with JavaScript where people can just view the source code. And OAuth 1 required that secret for everything to be secure. OAuth 2 decided, okay, we're going to make sure that it's possible for these to do an OAuth flow without requiring the secret. So a client secret does a couple of things, right? Which is it acts as the app's password. That's how the app authenticates. But without a client secret, we kind of don't have an authentication mechanism. So one of the things that OAuth 2 did was define a way to use um, to use to do, to do an OAuth flow that didn't require a client secret. And that was really the motivation behind the implicit flow. The problem is the implicit flow has this uh, inherent flaw, which is that it is insecure. And it's insecure because the access token is actually sent in the front channel. And the front channel is the, is the idea of using the browser's address bar to move data around. And I like to think of that as essentially just kind of throwing it over a wall and hoping someone on the other side of the wall catches it. Right. This OAuth server is trying to send this access token over to the OAuth client, but they can't see over the wall. So they can't actually see if it was caught. And this is a problem on the other side of the wall as well, where the, the thing receiving that data doesn't actually know if it's coming from the real OAuth server or not. So we're missing a lot of visibility whenever we send data over the front channel. And the problem with the implicit flow is that the access token is sent in the front channel. So a couple of years later, um, this new extension was developed called Pixie. And the idea was that it was an improvement to the authorization code flow that didn't require client secret, but was still secure. And that really took the place of the implicit flow in mobile apps a long time ago. So there was a separate document that actually describes the use of Pixie in mobile apps separate from the actual Pixie mechanism itself, because nothing about Pixie is actually special to mobile. And because of that, there was actually, uh, there's actually been a more recent effort over the last little over, actually almost two years now, of adopting Pixie in JavaScript apps as well in a browser because it's, it has the same problem as mobile apps where browser-based apps can't be deployed with a client secret. The implicit flow is still also insecure, always has been. And so if we can make an improvement to that, we can use the auth code flow with Pixie to improve that. So you might be wondering, well, why wasn't this a recommendation sooner? Why haven't we always done Pixie? It's a couple of reasons. One, it hadn't been invented yet. It, it was created after the original OS spec was created. But also, more importantly, browsers worked very different. What do these two browsers have in common? The, what they have in common is they don't support cross-origin resource sharing. Cores hadn't been invented yet either. The idea with cores, cross-origin resource sharing, is that if you have an app running on one domain where that's where the JavaScript is loaded from and it needs to go make requests to a different domain, that only works if the browser actually supports the headers that, that, that those websites can use to say, this is allowed. Otherwise, the browsers will block those cross-origin requests. Now, because of the way the auth code flow works, it requires a post request across to the where the tokens come from, which is very likely on a different domain. So that would only work if Cores was supported properly. And now, of course, Cores now is you know, widely supported. It's no longer an issue. And it's used in all, in all sorts of things in JavaScript. Apps. So we don't really worry about it anymore. It's widely available. So it now makes sense to use it for OAuth. So now we have a way to, instead of using the implicit flow, use Pixie, because we actually can now. So this this. This additional extension, browser-based apps, uh, the best BCP stands for best current practice. So this extension of OAuth for browser-based apps um, is really a collection of recommendations of how to do OAuth in that environment. And there's a couple of different things this, this spec says. In addition to saying browser apps should do Pixie, it also says, well, there's these different ways that these apps may be deployed. And in one case, your browser may be downloading JavaScript from a static web host that doesn't have any ability to run code. And then it makes API requests directly to the auth server and the, and the APIs. But you could also put a dynamic application server in between using HTTP-only cookies between the browser and that, and that dynamic component being the backend that manages tokens. And there's trade-offs to both of these, of course. But this is the sort of things that this document is laying out. So now we've got this 
collection of of documents and the um another document being added is the security best current practice this is still in progress this is not an rfc yet this document is a collection of best practices that say um it, des it, it describes a, a handful of different kinds of attacks or scenarios that you should be you should protect against and describes how and says uh puts more requirements on the system compared to what the original RFC says. So you can think of RFC 6749 as it's, well, it's called a framework. It's not actually a spec because it's actually, it actually says you can do things too many different ways to be considered a, a proper spec. So this is like tightening it up. And if you follow the security best current practices, then you will be doing OAuth in the most secure way that is currently known. And one of those ways, one of those things in that spec is that it says you can't do the you can't use the implicit flow anymore because there's just no way to keep it secure. One of the other things it says is that you actually can't use the password grant either because it's also got all these problems, and that an OAuth was actually created to avoid those problems. So that's in the in the document as well. One of the other things it says is there's actually a attack which uh, I'm not going to go into right now, but it's called the authorization code injection attack. It's pretty subtle, but it is notable because even a client secret doesn't protect against that. So one of the things the security best current practice says is even confidential clients, if, even if you do have a client secret, you should also be doing Pixie because Pixie protects against that. So um, if you are curious about that though, go check out the Okta developer YouTube channel. I have a couple of videos on the channel where we go over that attack scenario and demonstrate it. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's interesting if you're, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, lastly, the document also says, well, turns out putting access tokens in query strings was a terrible idea. And the only, again, the only reason for that was because cross-origin resource sharing didn't really exist then. So let's take that out as well. So we've got all these things like dropping the password grant. And this is like pretty dense text, but essentially it says why it's, it's a risk. And one of the reasons that the password grant was in there at all in the first place was actually to provide an upgrade path to OAuth for legacy apps. I think that's pretty funny that the password grant wasn't even meant to be a sort of new way to do things. It was really meant to be, well, if you already have a password because you're doing things pre-OAuth, now you have an upgrade path into, um, into OAuth 2. So what are we left with? Well, the security, uh, the security best current practice is really a collection of a lot of these different recommendations, like OAuth clients must use Pixie with the authorization code flow, can't use the password grant, must use exact string matching for redirect URLs, don't put your access tokens in the query string, and refresh tokens for public clients actually need to be um, sender constrained or one-time use. And these are defined in, in the spec as well, but the one-time use you could think of as also, or rotating is another way to say that, where refresh tokens are only valid once, and then you get a new one back when you use it. And the idea with that is that if you, if an application is a public client, which means it doesn't have a client secret, then the uh, the risk is if a refresh token is stolen, the refresh token is very powerful because it can continue to get, to get new access tokens. By making it one-time use, you end up making it more secure in that if a refresh token is stolen and someone does use it and the real app uses it, if it's attempted to be used twice, the system can recognize that as an attack, as a leak and shut it down. Okay, so that's a whole handful of, of RFCs and if you look at the space, you're probably thinking, okay, that was complicated. That is a lot going on. There's all these different documents flying around. And yes, I realize that it can feel like you are lost in a maze trying to get through this. So the main goal here and the effort that I'm leading in OAuth 2.1 is to help simplify this whole mess. If we take a look at what we were left with, what this is to OAuth 2 today. This is really what it looks like. We've got one RFC that says to do these things, another RFC that says actually don't do those. We've got these other things that you should be doing as well. And if you actually look at all of that and see what's left, it's actually a much simpler picture. It's actually that there's only two grant types really, and there's only two different ways to use access tokens. So this is what OAuth 2.1 is. OAuth 2.1 is meant to be this simplification of all of the best practices of OAuth rolled up into one so that you can avoid reading all of this legacy stuff. 
So OAuth 2.1, the overall goal is to consolidate the current stable OAuth 2 best practices. Add best practices, add new specs that are considered stable and well, well deployed and highly supported, and remove deprecated features that everybody knows is not secure. So while doing that, this already exists today. This is mostly the OAuth 2 security best current practice, which references all the other specs in this dependency tree. Really, the idea is to capture all of that in a new name. Another, another important uh, goal of this document is that OAuth 2, when it was originally written, left a lot of holes open for future extensions, future extension points. And that was really useful because it meant that work can continue separately and we can iterate on you know, adding new token types or adding mutual TLS or adding structure into access tokens or whatever it is. That can all happen independently. So where there are these sort of gaps in OAuth 2.0, we've decided to reference current extensions that exist and say, here's some options you have. And by the way, one of these is actually well-documented here. A couple of things that OAuth 2.1 is not doing. OAuth 2.1 is not going to define new behavior. So essentially, if you're familiar with OAuth 2, at least all the collections of those reference of the specs that I mentioned, that is OAuth 2.1. You don't need to learn anything new. It's actually just sort of a roll up. And we also don't want to include anything experimental, in progress, or not widely implemented. So let me give you a quick rundown of OAuth 2.1. It is essentially a consolidation. What we did as the authors was went through the these lists of specs and consolidated them into one document. We started with core, we added in uh, bear tokens, we added in the native app BCP. And it turns out when you combine all those into one document, there's a lot of sections that are redundant. So we got to take out a lot of stuff, which is always great for specs. So it's not actually as long as all these put together. So what it does is it defines uh, the authorization code flow with Pixie. It defines the client credentials grant, implicit and password are left out. Um, it defines stricter requirements on redirect URLs, just like the security BCP. And it puts these requirements on refresh tokens for single page apps. And there's a handful of other things in there as well. But again, it's really just a roll up of these existing specs. One of the other interesting things that uh, sort of came out of our discussions as we were working on this was this idea of client types. So you might be familiar with the idea of public clients and confidential clients. So public clients are the class of clients like mobile apps, single page apps, um, TV apps, anything where it's a compiled or, or scripted app where the app is actually running on a device in the user's control. The particular challenge there is that it is impossible to issue a secret to that application. So if you imagine you try to put a secret into your JavaScript app, put in your source code, now that's up on a website. As soon as someone goes and visits the website, they download that, they can view source, and see the secret. It's not really a secret anymore. Confidential clients, on the other hand, are apps that can keep a secret. And those are traditional, uh, traditionally web apps. So that'll be things like your .NET apps or Java apps. Anytime the source code of the app is running in an environment that the developer controls, not the user. So that's been sort of the, the main divide between these two different types of apps. And most of the OAuth spec is based around the uh, these two apps. And it used to be that we required Pixie only for public clients and didn't require it for confidential clients, but it turns out that it's actually useful for confidential clients too now. But there's other things in the spec that put requirements on one type of app versus the other. But one of the tricks is that if you look closely, there's a bunch of references in the spec to uh, things that it'll say like public clients or clients that have credentials. And you're like, wait a second, wouldn't that make it a confidential client? But if it was a confidential client, wouldn't they have said confidential client? And it turns out that the spec had always been sort of dancing around this idea of a third client type. So we've decided to actually put a name to that third client type. And that name is credentialed client. So I do want to emphasize that this is not a new thing. Because again, we're not trying to add new things into OAuth 2.1. We're trying to capture the current state. So the thing I want to point out is that credential client, this distinction, has always existed. So here's an example from the spec. If the client type is confidential, 
or the client was issued client credentials. How would a client be issued client credentials if it wasn't confidential? Well, that's what a credential client is. Now, a example of that would be a client that uses dynamic client registration. So you ship an app to the app store, no secret in the app. The app is downloaded, there's no secret. The app wakes up the first time and the first thing it does is it goes and uses dynamic client registration to register itself at the OAuth server. Then it gets a client secret. Now that secret lives only within that one instance of the app. So for some parts of the spec, it can act like a client secret. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't confirm the identity of the app because the act of getting that secret didn't require authentication. So there was no identity, there's no provable identity of the application in that case. So that's the distinction that credential client makes. A credential client is a client that has credentials, but whose identity is not confirmed. So probably the most common example will be a client that obtains a client secret via dynamic client registration. So this is the summary of OAuth 2.1. The document was recently adopted officially by the OAuth working group. So it is now a official document on the list on track, and we are continuing to make progress moving forward. The, um, you can learn more about that document. You can find all the links and references at OAuth.net slash 2.1. Um, the current status is it is we're looking for feedback. We want people to read through it, provide feedback. The best way to do that is on the mailing list. If you don't feel like doing that, you can also just email me. You can file issues on GitHub. Um, however you want to is fine. But we really want to make sure that this makes it a lot easier to get started with OAuth by reducing the number of documents you need to read in order to actually understand what is going on and what's the most secure way to build OAuth systems. So thank you very much. Um, you can find more about me at on Twitter, Aaron PK. My website is AaronPK.com. If you would like to uh, find a copy of my book, or if you would like stickers of this adorable cat, you can find that at OAuth.wtf. Thank you very much. OK, so <clears throat> so thanks, everyone. So uh, we, we, we still have one or two minutes. So um, yep. Uh, maybe everyone, can you share share some quick uh, uh, last uh, last minute tips and tricks? So, if uh, how will the developers try to adopt the two point one? Is there any special uh, point of uh, you they need to look and they need to pay attention when they need to adopt the two point one? Yeah, yeah. So the the there's two parts to this, I guess. So if you have been keeping up with OAuth two point zero and are following the best the security best current practices and all of those kinds of things and doing things generally securely, you are already going to be compliant with OAuth 2.1. There shouldn't be anything new that's in there that's a surprise. So if you do want to get a sort of head start on this, if you aren't sure if you're doing things the best way, you can start reading the security best current practice and all of the existing OAuth documents to talk about. If you do have a mobile app, go make sure you've read through the, the RFC for mobile apps. Make sure you're following those recommendations about how to use browsers and mobile, things like that. So if we, um, if you, yeah, if you do want to sort of make sure that you will be compliant with OAuth 2.1, really that just means that you're compliant with the best practices of OAuth 2 today. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, so if uh, any one of you, I uh, would like to talk more to everyone, feel free to reach him out. So uh, everyone, you can, uh, actually you can also type your contact uh, uh, email, etc. on the stage so that people can also uh, wish you out. So thanks for your time, okay. So, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so thanks, everyone.